on so many levels. The one thing I will say is that when we have the privilege of living a life where we get to give back, uh, the important thing to remember is whatever we do, whether we're the employee at a nonprofit, or we're on the board, or we're in a committee, or we chair a committee, and maybe don't, have, don't do all of the work, but we delegate really well. Whatever we do, it's enough, and it makes a difference. And I want to thank each of you for making a difference. I want to thank, did I say Grizzly Liquor? Yes. I called out Mary from MCAP, but I just want to do it again. It really is so incredibly helpful for us to have the quality videos, because I'm telling you what, you would, you would know if I took them. <laughs> they would not look like that. They would sound like that. It, just, it would be enough, because whatever we do, it's enough. <laughs> However, this is way better. So thank you, Mary Gray. Let's give it up.
And we are one of only three abortion providers in the state of Montana, with Planned Parenthood of Montana having four clinics, um, and all families health care up in Whitefish. Uh, both Blue Mountain Clinic and the Helena Planned Parenthood provide a procedural abortion care up to 21 weeks and six days. And Helen is a nurse practitioner in Whitefish, and she provides procedural care up to 12 weeks. And then all of us do medication abortion, including uh, medication abortion by mail. And that goes up to 11 weeks of gestation. Um, we, Blue Mountain Clinic, has a very unique model. We are one of the only clinics in the country. I think that there's five of us that have this model of pr providing primary care and um, have fully integrated abortion care into those services. So it, we are um, a very unique service delivery model. Um, we have just <coughs> launched a new website two weeks ago, so I'm going to be pulling some um, slides from the new website, which I'm very proud of. It was a year in the making. Um, this is our new logo at the bottom. Just felt like it was time to modernize a bit. Um, so our mission is to provide comprehensive and evidence-based primary health care services in a compassionate and empowering environment to all persons who seek it. We are especially honored to provide abortion care, gender-affirming care, mental health care, suboxone treatment to folks with an opioid use disorder, um, all of these as essential and fully integrated components of primary health care and all under one roof. So here's our, um, our front homepage of our new website, um, vibrant, fun, and um, you know, this is part of my contribution, is, and, and all of our clinicians are, of course, are providing evidence-based health care, but with the attacks that we're seeing on abortion care right now, um, and gender affirming care, we just really wanted to um, highlight that all of this is, of course, in compliance with very robust data and evidence and clinical guidelines. And we, you know, with what's happening in our region and, and with the recent legislative session, we are hearing from so many Montanans across the state that they are really confused about the state of legal abortion right now. And so we are trying to really highlight to everyone that abortion is legal in Montana. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case for our neighbors. North Dakota currently has no access. It's completely illegal in South Dakota. And Idaho has implemented a six-week ban. Um, we are seeing a lot of folks from Idaho right now, and they are incredibly scared. They are so fearful that coming across the border and getting care is, is still going to land them in jail. So our uh, abortion care team is spending a lot of time talking to folks about we're not sharing medical records, we will not call, you know, we will not share information with the police, um, and it is it is a really sad situation of what we're dealing with right now. And of course, we got the injunction on the SB 99 bill and have uh, put the gender affirming care ban on hold while that plays out in the courts. Um, feeling very grateful that our young people under the age of 18 can still um, access gender affirming care in Montana. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of a fun historical timeline. Again, this is on our website. So just some kind of key dates of, of Blue Mountain Clinic's history. So in 1973, of course, we have the Roe v. Wade decision. In 1976, Blue Mountain Women's Clinic, um, articles of incorporation are filed, and the clinic opens in 1977. In 1978, they move into a larger downtown space um, where they're able to expand um, access and do things like annual exams. And then our internal access fund, which is what we're talking about today, has actually been around since 1979. Um, and the need for an access fund is because a lot of insurance, uh, health insurance co programs do not cover the cost of abortion care. And this, you know, for most folks coming up with even $300 can be really tricky. Um, so that we dip into our access fund when we have patients who need that extra financial subsidization. Um, in the early 80s, the clinic expanded to provide prenatal and pediatric care. Unfortunately, we got priced out of the, the prenatal uh, obstetric care a while ago, but they did provide that service for quite some time. And then in 1983, um, they started the community education program, and that was the first year of the Mountain Women's Clinic annual women's, all women's run. Um, this is an artist up here who's done these beautiful drawings of all the independent abortion clinics in the country, so this is one that they made for Blue Mountain Clinic. Uh, in 1991, the clinic expands to become a full primary care clinic. So we had um, some internal medicine docs and family medicine docs come into the practice at that time and truly grew um, through the clinic. And then changed the name from Blue Mountain Women's Clinic to just Blue Mountain's Clinic to um, reflect that, that change and, and be more of an inclusive space for everyone. 
Um, some of you might remember that in 1993, the clinic was firebombed, so completely destroyed. Um, luckily, it happened in the middle of the night, and no one was hurt. Um, the, the person who did this was, had actually bombed a clinic in Idaho as well, um, and they did end up catching that person. So they were in kind of a strip mall at the time, and we just um, recognized the 30-year anniversary of that um, devastating moment. Uh, so Willa Craig, who was the executive director at the time, is quoted in the Missoulian, our commitment to justice and dignity in healthcare in the Missoula community cannot be consumed by an arsonist match. I think that's a really powerful quote. So uh, the community rallies around the clinic. Um, it's really amazing to think about what that must have looked like. And they uh, established the clinic that we're currently in in 1995 and they built us a fortress, and I'm incredibly grateful for the clinic that they built. It is, they were thinking ahead and made it very fireproof and bullet resistant glass, and it's an incredibly secure and also lovely space, so we're very grateful for that. Um, and then in 1999, we were starting to see some of the anti-abortion rhetoric coming up, and Montana providers were, were fighting back. Um, so Dr. Armstrong, who was an abortion provider up in Kalispell, had filed a lawsuit against the state of Montana, and the Montana Supreme Court unanimously decided in 1999 that Montanans had the right to abortion care uh, given our strong protections and privacy. So that is a court case that we rely heavily on today. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead to uh, more recent times here. So in 2021, the state legislature starts passing um, well, we have no longer a Democratic governor, which of course we had for 16 years with the veto pen at the governor's office. So in 2021, they were able to pass four anti-abortion laws um, into, uh, well, they passed them. Planned Parenthood at the time was the only plaintiff that took those on. So luckily, um, all four of those are enjoined, um, and that included um, some major restrictions on medication abortion, um, I think a 15-week ban, and some, some other restrictions, but those are not in effect while those lawsuits play out. And then just last year, so this is now when I'm coming onto the scene and executive director of the Mountain Clinic, so one of the other laws that they passed in 2021 was this really terrible law that the antis have called Born Alive and essentially would have forced any pediatrician neonatologist with an infant born who had a fetal diagnosis that was non-compatible with life they would have been forced to provide life-saving, extraordinary life-saving measures to that infant. And that would be things like intubation, needles, you know, all of that. And really, in that moment, those parents just needed to hold their baby in their arms and say goodbye. Um, so incredibly devastating bill and would have forced any provider who didn't comply with that to be um, in prison for up to 20 years. So we, Montana was the first state in the country to see that put in front of the voters. Uh, so we stood up a campaign called the No on LR131 campaign. You might have remembered that, it wasn't too long ago. And I will just say that the polling showed us having no path to victory. There was almost no money that supported that campaign. We were a scrappy group of folks that just felt like we had to try. And in the end, we defeated it by a six point margin. Woohoo! We ran about a million dollar campaign at the end of the day, which was actually quite a lot. We thought originally getting 200,000 was, was going to be a big deal. Um, and this was an article that ran in many newspapers across Montana, and all of those names are healthcare providers that were signing their names onto a no, no vote. So um, just really grateful for all those folks who stood up. Um, and then here we are today, 2023. Um, we just survived a very difficult legislative session. They passed nine anti-abortion bills this time, um, and we have successfully put, um, joined through lawsuits four of those bills. The other three technically don't really have an impact, so those bills are in effect and we are complying with those laws, um, but the other four are enjoined and, and we feel like we have a really strong chance of, of seeing those fully defeated as they play out through the courts. And that includes a DE &E ban, which is the most common procedure performed for most abortions after 15 weeks, um, bans on telehealth, ban, and a big one, ban on Medicaid coverage for abortion care. 
So Montana is one of only 16 states in the country that has state Medicaid funding that covers abortion care. It's incredibly wonderful that we have that. And they finally kind of picked up on that and they're going after it in, in big ways. Um, and we have a lot of uh, legal precedents as to why we have that law in effect in Montana. And so I think we have a good chance of, of maintaining um, and the Blue Mountain Clinic is also, and all families up in Whitefish were also plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit. You might have heard that there's um, a lawsuit playing out that started in Amarillo, Texas to try and stop mifepristone, which is one of the two pills used in medication abortion. Um, they're trying to say that the FDA did not approve that medication correctly in 2000. So we've got 23 years of great safety data and, and millions of users of this medication and they're trying to completely take it off the markets. And that would be nationwide. It would include states that have legal access to abortion. So because of our attorney general, um, many states have filed a lawsuit in Washington and gotten protections out of the Fourth Circuit, sorry, Ninth Circuit. And, um, and those are states that have good, you know, blue states that have access to abortion. Montana, Virginia, and Kansas are all anti-attorney general, so we had to file our own lawsuit in the Fourth Circuit, which is in Virginia, um, and we're trying to get those same protections as, as the blue states. So we have optimism from that judge that he will grant us those um, protections if the Supreme Court ends up hearing that case and, and we have to challenge that. So um, yeah, we're very honored to provide, um, continue to provide this comprehensive family medicine and abortion care. Um, here's a list of our, our services that the clinic is providing today. We have one mental health therapist on staff. She um, takes a lot of referrals internally from our own patients. It's a really nice system. And we've just released our latest impact report. So this is with 2022 data. Um, we provided over 13,000 services to almost 3,500 unique patients last year. Um, we provided 489 patients with wellness exams. 128 of those were folks under the age of 18, and we do see a Medicare population um, provided 133 wellness exams to Medicare patients, uh, provided 921 vaccines. We're currently seeing 191 transgender patients and um, 139 HIV tests, tests for biopsies and cervical cancer, and we have over 100 um, patients receiving mental health. Um, we had an opportunity to bring in a photojournalist from Reuters last year, and this is um, a picture of Dr. Caitlin Blau performing an abortion. Um, so these pictures are now available through the Reuters site, and um, it's very expensive for us to get access to these photos, so we can like show them and things like this, but we can't put them on our website because we want actually own the pictures, but um, it was a really cool experience to have them come in and document. This is Julie Millette, our RN, um, also holding the hand of a, of a patient during an abortion procedure. And this is Dr. Rabbits, who does only family medicine and takes care of more of our older population, and, and you can see the patient there. So, um, you know, we believe that access to healthcare is a human right and that cost should never be a barrier. Um, part of our model right now is 40% of our patients are enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and for our abortion patients, we work closely with our statewide abortion fund, the Montana Abortion Access Program, um, and we work together with our internal fund and them to help provide that financial support to anybody who needs it. So a little bit more about our access fund. Again, we subsidize the cost of abortion, contraception, and gender affirming care um, for those without insurance and those with high deductibles. And women are the vast majority of recipients of these funds. The cost of an abortion ranges from $300 to $1,800, and um, that's a lot of money for, for some folks to come up with. And then we also provide uh, assistance if they need help getting here, so they might need gas cards or uh, money to have a hotel room. Um, we also subsidize the cost of child care. So in 2022, from our internal access fund, we used about $18,000, and that supported 82 individuals. Um, with a the average um, subsidization being about $219. And so far this year, we've actually been relying on MAP a lot more. They've had a lot more capacity to fund patients. So we've only used about 6,500 in our internal fund, and that supported 46 patients um, with an average of 141 per patient. Um, so yeah, we would 
use these this ten thousand dollars to to fully um, fund our access fund, and that could um, support approximately forty five individuals at that average amount of about two hundred nineteen dollars. Um, and we do predominantly serve individuals within Missoula County and city. Um, however, we are serving a lot of folks that have to travel into Missoula to get this care, um, both from across Montana as well. And we've been seeing some patients from Texas and other restricted states as well. Um, and yeah, this is our values. You know, we just believe that healthcare is for everybody, and um, we we really hold this value close to our hearts um, and, and how we provide healthcare every day. We have a really amazing healthcare team. And that is my presentation. I'm happy to answer. We have about five minutes. If there are any questions, uh, please do feel free and don't censor yourself. Any questions you might have, please ask Louise. How would like you to What are the qualifications for people to access the access fund? Like, is it just based on do they have? I mean, what is what is the need threshold? I guess. Yeah, that's a good question. So we really do it on a patient by patient basis. So typically when our folks are scheduling an appointment, they'll tell them how much it's going to cost, and then they'll ask them, and there's sort of a financial aid counseling process that they go through. Do you plan to use your insurance for this? Um, would you be able to come up with the money for this? And then if they say no, then they say, okay, what do you think you could contribute? And then let that person come up with a number that they think is, is reasonable for them. And then um, the questions become like, if you gave that amount, would you be able to pay your rent this month? Would you be able to buy groceries? Would you be able to afford childcare? And so they kind of work through <coughs> those questions and get a really good sense of like what this individual needs. Um, you know, a lot of folks that come down from or like come in from Eastern Montana, like they might be really worried about the travel, and so we'll work with them to figure out like what does that look like for you? What do you need as far as gas money or hotels and um, you know, and also like knowing that we need to make these monies stretch as far as we can to help as many people as we can. We try to be, you know, reasonable around um, meeting people where they're at and also making sure that they're able to contribute what they can. Yeah. Um, so with the availability of NAP funding to cover abortion care, will the access fund be able to cover <coughs> contraceptive care or gender affirming care if it is going to come? Yeah, I believe we would. In fact, um, we have just recently expanded the access fund's use for gender affirming care. Um, folks that are needing to, you know, buy needles and things like that um, for testosterone injections or whatever, those costs have really been adding up for some of our patients. So we've decided to start um, using these access funds for that. So I do think it would open up um, a lot more money for patients that needed help with with those other costs for contraception and, and gender affirming care. And I think we could kind of take some burden off of MAP and. Um, you know, their numbers that we're serving through MAP are through the roof right now, also. Have you started to see the effects of the Medicaid redetermination and enrollment, and what do you predict will happen? It's a meteor breaking, yes. We are seeing so many patients who used to qualify for Medicaid that no longer do, or who have Medicaid and now they've lost it. Um, and it is putting a huge burden on the abortion fund. So I sit on the board of MAP, and um, the amount of funding that we have had to um, subsidize in the last several months is nearly double what it was in the previous months for that. So, um, yeah, and, and just the stress and anxiety of the patients that we're working with who didn't get the letter in time, didn't know about the, the re you know, I mean, all of that, and it's, it's just really heartbreaking. Can you talk a little bit about how maybe the pressures of some of these states that have banned abortion have put on sort of like having things done within the 12 weeks and what that looks like for your clinic and maybe other clinics across the state? Um, so Blue Mountain Clinic, we go to 22 weeks. Um, what do you mean by the 12 weeks? Well, I guess more sort of like if people are trying to make decisions and they can't get services wherever they're at, right? Has, has the increase of out-of-state patients hindered your ability to provide services to, um, you know, Missoula Regional patients, or um, how, are, how are people getting served with 
serve an increase probably with services within Montana? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, we are not seeing the surge in Montana that we thought we would and that we are prepared for. So I'm spending a lot of my time right now calling clinics in Illinois and New Mexico that have a three-week wait list, and I'm saying we could get them in tomorrow. We have huge capacity in Montana to see a ton more patients, and I think one of the hypotheses of the abortion movement was that people would readily get on a plane and fly somewhere where they could, especially if the cost of that airline ticket was covered. And what we're finding from like a solid 80% of patients is they're like, I've never been to Montana. Why would I get on an airplane and go get an abortion there when my uncle couldn't drive and come pick me up if something went wrong, right? And so it's like this huge like specter of the unknown and it's so far away from home for people that we, you know, but my hypothesis is that there's still 10 to 20% of people that would feel comfortable traveling. And so how do we identify those folks and get them into states that have availability so that you can take the burden off of the clinics in Illinois and Florida and New Mexico that are completely overrun? Um, so we really haven't like experienced a huge surge that is impacting either our abortion availability or our family practice at Blue Mountain Clinic. Um, I think that we can do a better job of advertising in places like Idaho and South Dakota to get them into Montana for medication abortion. So that might be like, they have to make that decision within the first 11 weeks of pregnancy. But the great thing about the two independent clinics is that if they come within the borders, we will send those pills to their hotel room or a UPS box or whatever. Um, Planned Parenthood is making a little more conservative decision and the patients actually have to go to their clinic physically. So um, there is a little bit of a different approach in that way right now. Um, but we're trying to, to provide as much access at, within the legal bounds of what we can work in right now. Thank you. There may be more questions, but we want to make sure that we share the time. So we will be done in approximately 7.35. And so please feel free, if you didn't get your question, to know that uh, our presenters will still be available to you. One of the challenges that the steering committee of the Giving Circle has is we have 13 amazing applicants. I mean, you my humanness, you know, my nata. I've had to thank the other 10 applicants because we have 13 amazing applications. And one of the things uh, that we're grappling with is how to let you know about the other applications. And so hopefully next year we'll have a system in place and we're going to provide you an opportunity to be involved with that. But in the meantime, am I doing this right, Mary? Awesome. In the meantime, though, our goal when we meet and we go to the final is to provide you three diverse applications serving three different needs of the grant focus, which this year is women's issues. So I have the privilege, but Mac, I forgot to ask your name, so you'll be chopped liver. But I want to introduce from the International Rescue Committee, Sarah Howerton, and I never checked out if I say it correctly, and Mac chopped liver. <laughs> this is the International Rescue Committee. I'm sorry, Mac. Please oh, no, tell me. No. No.
Um, so yeah, I'll kind of breeze through that, and then I'll turn it over to Mac to um, really dive into the, the program that we are piloting. Um, so the IRC was founded um, in 1933. It's an international NGO slash nonprofit. Um, and yeah, founded in 1933, the early mission was to help European academic scientists and artists who were fleeing um, persecution uh, by the Nazis. And the mission sort of evolved. We stayed on to help uh, thousands more people flee. Um, and today, uh, we kind of have two major areas of programming. Um, our international humanitarian aid programs, uh, we respond in a number of capacities to different conflicts, disasters, wars, as things are unfolding. Um, and here in the United States, uh, we conduct refugee resettlement programs. Uh, Missoula is one of 29 field offices. Um, we're headquartered in New York City, where we receive uh, basically a financial and programmatic oversight. And we have an advocacy team based out of Washington, DC. Uh, so specifically, the IRC in Missoula, we haven't been in Missoula too terribly long. Uh, we opened in 2016 at the invitation of uh, Another local organization, South Landing Missoula, I'm sure many people are familiar with that organization. Uh, since then, we've resettled over 600 individuals into our Missoula community uh, from nine different countries. In, most, in the most recent couple of years, uh, the majority of the people that we are resettling are coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, but we've also had families from Eritrea, Iraq, Iran, Burma, Yemen, and Ukraine. Um, it averages out to about 115 individuals per year. Um, and then this coming fiscal year, which uh, for us started October 1st, we anticipate reselling 140 individuals. Uh, so whether we are responding to crises internationally or conducting refugee resettlement here, um, the, the mission of the International Rescue Committee is the same. It remains to help people whose lives are shattered by conflict and disaster to recover and gain control of their future. So we're really focused on uh, helping people to reclaim their lives, uh, have a sense of agency, a sense of choice, um, and, and kind of be able to, to build their lives here. Um, so I do want to uh, take a moment to kind of look at the word refugee. I think um, it does get used incorrectly um, a lot, and so I just want to define it and make sure we're all thinking about it uh, in the same way. So even though there are uh, globally over 100 million individuals who are displaced by either conflict or famine disaster, um, approximately 29.4 million of those individuals hold refugee status, and it is a legal status as defined by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees um, in the 1951 Refugee Convention. Um, so in order to um, get refugee status, an individual uh, must have fled their country and crossed an international border in doing so. They must be unable to return to their home country. They must be unable to return to their home country based on a well-founded fear of uh, persecution due to race, religion, and nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Um, so again, uh, those 29.4 individuals with refugee status, um, one of the options um, for them, if they're unable to return home, if they can't for some reason stay in a host country, um, is to be resettled in another country like the United States, uh, Canada, Germany, uh, along those lines. Um, and long story short, Missoula, Montana is one of those destinations that people might find themselves in, uh, which is really cool. So we, um, over the last probably two years, have done a lot of growth, uh, but our, our first and primary sort of area of programming is the reception and placement program. Um, so anyone arriving to Missoula uh, kind of goes through this program, and it's focused on um, core services and think of sort of Maslow's hierarchy, we uh, are really focused in those early days helping people find uh, shelter, housing, um, making sure that they uh, have an income, whether it's through public benefits or uh, through employment as quickly as possible. Uh, we help people get access to healthcare services in the community, get kids enrolled into school or daycare. Uh, we have immigration services and help them with uh, adjusting their legal status as time goes on. Um, and this program is uh, sort of capped at 90 days. Um, and if you can 
try to imagine trying to start your life over somewhere and have it all figured out in 90 days. Um, it's, it's quick, um, and, and that's sort of a, a, a federal um, timeline that, that we have by. Um, so we also have a couple of economic empowerment programs. We have a matching grant employment program, which focuses um, on getting people um, in jobs that are of interest to them, that, that pay decent wages, that might um, have pathways to advancement. Uh, we just started a financial coaching program, which is really exciting, um, but and by Justin in about two weeks ago, so uh, more to come on that. Um, we have the Refugee Support Services uh, program, as well as um, we're getting a career pathways development program off the ground as well. So a lot of really exciting growth more recently that uh, for the first time we're able to kind of address needs and gaps beyond those um, kind of critical basic needs. Uh, we have a supplemental case management program that's also pretty new uh, for individuals who um, beyond the capacity of the reception and placement or employment programs and people are still needing um, more assistance if they have you know certain circumstances that are challenging health related maybe they lose a job this program really kind of helps them to access resources in the community and just helps them kind of develop the skills to navigate those things. Um, and lastly, our refugee health uh, promotions programming. Um, this provides further opportunities for our clients to access health and mental health services in the community. Um, and then uh, it's actually kind of where our women's wellness groups program that we are seeking funds for to, to get this program off the ground is housed. Um, although it is in partnership with the supplemental case management program. Um, and again, kind of coming back to the, the idea that these services that we have um, offered for several years uh, really address the basic needs. Um, we connect a lot of people to resources in the community. Um, and this is true of Missoula, and it's true of any other city, large or small, that uh, does refugee resettlement, is that a lot of our services are not geared towards or tailored to individuals who uh, have the unique needs, uh, unique barriers that um, that our clients are facing. And so um, services might exist, but a lot of times uh, the refugee population does fall through the cracks. So with that, I will hand it over to Matt to talk about our Women's Wellness Group program. Thank you. You'll have to bear with me. I haven't used the microphone since high school. I'm done some flashbacks. So. <laughs> But yeah, so why we're here, um, we are requesting funds for our women wellness program. Uh, this is gonna be a pilot program um, just starting this year. We did something semi-similar, uh, similar but not robust at all last year um, with some women's groups uh, that were more support and kind of just social support focused. So we're hoping that we can expand on that idea and create groups that are um, more robust and kind of uh, support our communities a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to start though first with why the need exists. So uh, research shows us that about 54% of uh, refugees throughout the world will suffer from um, severe emotional disorders. Uh, they do, refugees are found to have about 10 times the rate of PTSD as general, popula uh, general populations in the United States do. And then uh, large scale meta-analyses um, pretty much across the board find that 30% of displaced individuals throughout the world will suffer from post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. That's just one example. That doesn't even take into account the high rates of anxiety, high rates of depression, um, and high rates of other uh, kind of severe emotional disorders that do exist within these communities. And that's all pre-migration trauma and pre-migration uh, challenges that folks face. Um, Post-migration research on displaced populations is just sort of starting to get off the ground a little bit. Um, started with uh, right before COVID, and then COVID kind of shut everything down, as we know, included research on these populations. Um, however, virtually research does indicate that uh, post-migration, some of these trends do actually um, remain pretty much the same and actually increase as folks are resettled into communities. Um, those rates of PTSD, anxiety, depression, everything of that nature kind of do um, kind of shoot up as people are resettled. Um, Challenges include linguistic, vocational, uh, educational, social, everything kind of associated with living as a human being in our country. Um, and we do, and we have found as well, research has found that stressors and these challenges do disproportionately affect female presenting um, 
populations within these communities. Um, you can take some of those uh, kind of numbers and just basically increase them for any female population. And um, the largest kind of uh, challenge that our women face within these communities is social and emotional isolation. Uh, I read a study recently that um, social isolation is equivalent to smoking about 15 cigarettes a day. It's about how detrimental it can be to your health overall. And so this program is really um, geared toward helping to support folks uh, to increase their social and emotional support networks, and then also to have um, some different uh, educational opportunities and informational opportunities around nutrition, health, and wellness just in general. Uh, so there's a number of different barriers that our um, clients and folks that we serve do face as they uh, kind of integrate into the community. And I should preface this by saying these aren't exclusive to Missoula by any means. This is pretty much nationwide and across the board. People do suffer from uh, these barriers and do kind of uh, get restricted from these barriers. And Missoula is, generally speaking, a little bit better than some of our other communities throughout the United States. For example, our bus system is free, um, whereas in other cities it might cost money. However, it's still a physical barrier because all of the bus systems are in English and not geared toward non English speaking. Populations. You can imagine when you travel to a foreign country, you're trying to read a sign, you're getting lost, you're trying to figure out where you are. Right now, that's your daily life, and that's your trip, your ability to try and access care. Same kind of with healthcare and mental health care as well. Um, for those physical barriers, cultural barriers exist as well. Um, child uh, rearing norms within different cultures do kind of differ from our own. More often than not, our female presenting individuals are responsible for the majority of the child care. Um, that's often on top of work and on top of getting into health appointments, um, on top of trying to settle into the new house. Um, and so just, you know, in that kind of restricts a lot of being able to engage with different social um, programs that might already exist within a community. Uh, that also has to do with gathering norms too. Gathering norms are different. Our, our male presenting populations are really great at gathering. They go play volleyball, soccer, all these things together. It's awesome to see. However, more often than not, that's not an encouraged practice within um, a lot of cultures that we do work with for our female presenting populations. So really giving them space to be able to do that and to be able to um, gather is vitally important to supporting their social, emotional, and uh, physical health. Uh, and then the final kind of barrier, and these are this is by no means exhaustive, I shouldn't say that. But our final barrier is the language barrier. Um, basically, anything that's been translated and then back translated into another language is found, whether it's healthcare or mental health care, has been found to be about two to three times less effective than if it's administered in their um, in their native uh, language. And so, this sort of group of this nature would give folks kind of the ability to gather and share information with one another. Um, and potentially with other presenters from their native cultures to be able to uh, have greater access into those different uh, resources, educational and informational. Um, so why, why a group? Why not just spend money on uh, sending people to like Western therapeutic programs? Uh, basically, uh, I was talking to a woman named Dr. Susie Ishmael. She ran, she runs like a really wonderful emotional support program on the East Coast called Cornerstone. And she told me at one point, anecdotally, about 70 to 80 percent of folks that you work with, right from within the refugee population, will go to Western therapeutic programs once, and then they'll just never show up again. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not any, any anything that's meant to offend any therapist or anything like that. It's just not the way that social, emotional, and wellness in general is supported within uh, many of the cultures that we work with. So because of that, we've been kind of, as an organization, shifting focus from individual therapeutic and wellness interventions into community as an intervention. So providing a space where people can uh, lean on the community support that exists to help them to grow out of the trauma they might have faced, help them to connect to one another, and. Um, lessen that social and emotional uh, isolation that is occurring. Social isolation being um, kind of not your ability to like access friends or a support network, whereas emotional is um, having that network when you are from a multi-generational home disappear once you enter into the United States and you're now alone. And then finally, community as a practice does provide uh, really wonderful uh, opportunities for practical informational and emotional support. 
So these groups are as uh, kind of that effort, as Sarah highlighted, you know, we are fairly good at covering the bottom tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. However, now we're trying to expand and create better support networks that um, do help to uh, kind of support some of those more complex needs that might exist within the communities. Um, and one of those large scale gaps that exists in the Missoula displaced community is our being representing individuals able to access into support networks. Um, and so this would be a group that met bi-weekly, about twice a month, for about six months to 12 meetings total. Um, and in, a, in this slide, I do highlight it'd be 12 meetings per community. Community would be divided by um, what your native language would be. So Arabic individuals would meet with all Arabic individuals. Dari and Pashtu would meet with Dari and Pashtu. Uh, that's just in an effort to alleviate um, some of that interpretive kind of uh, snafus that can occur. I can tell you right now, if you meet in a room with like seven different languages at one time, it just evolves into chaos in about 15 minutes. So um, it would be per community that we would be providing these groups. And uh, we would be providing culturally appropriate food, drink, uh, child, and child care um, for all of the uh, women that did attend in these groups. So the goals would be to provide a safe space for gathering. That's our most important goal. If we can, if we can do that, then we've, we've won uh, at the end of the day, honestly. Uh, in addition to that, it's, uh, we want to foster a greater sense of community for our uh, women, our displaced women in the Missoula community. We want to help uh, provide women with education around physical and mental health, help them to expand um, sort of their horizons within these realms. And then hopefully our, our end goal here, and I think we brought a few copies of a mock-up of these, would be to produce um, a lot of our women love cooking. And uh, last year when we did engage in this group, the past day, I, I provided child care all of last year, which they loved as men can usually help with child care. So I was in the bathroom with about 15 to 16. Um, children sprinting around and they love checking in and seeing me trying to crowd all the kids. And it was not great, but um, one of the best days was uh, uh, we spent a day cooking and sharing recipes with one another and they bought me back all the food that they had cooked and um, for the next six weeks or so, every time I visit a woman, I would hear about this group and how wonderful it was to share a recipe. And so hopefully our, our, our goal would be to produce a cookbook of some nature that um, kind of connects into the story of the individual, so giving them a voice, giving them a platform to speak to their experience, and then also a way of sharing recipes um, across cultures. And then finally, uh, we do just want to provide space and environment in which displaced voices, needs, wants, and uh, are amplified and centered. And so hopefully, with the support of you all, or you know, just in general, we can get this group <laughs> off the ground and uh, going and help to support our So we have about three minutes for questions, but a reminder that we will have some time at the end of the evening for you all to socialize. So I already see a hand up, but I'm giving it back to you, right? Yes. So it's Kathy and Nicole. Oh, sorry, I thought I was my hand. Yeah, no, I just work. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, uh, break down uh, how that $10,000 would be used in your budget. Great, great question. Um, and so, um, kind of from the budgetary perspective, the $10,000 would, uh, by and large, go to support um, the sort of activities, um, the production of a, of a finalized cookbook at the end. Um, so, without the $10,000, these groups will uh, proceed um, and they will continue to be as max as like what they were initially which is more of like a social gathering but with the ten thousand um, dollars that would go towards uh, culturally appropriate uh, food and refreshments sorry, at I'm sorry can you oh the mic please because yes. it's being recorded yes sorry just please um, no worries uh, go towards providing food at all of the meetings um, it would go towards uh, providing materials pens notebooks, things for people to, to journal in. It would go towards uh, purchasing groceries. Um, so for, for every language group, uh, we've sort of budgeted for 
three separate cooking sessions so that purchases ingredients, cooking implements, um, for, for people to be able to participate in the cooking workshops. Um, we're currently administering a needs assessment uh, to kind of determine what activities these women might like to participate in. Um, and so we've also budgeted for the possibility of bringing in presenters or uh, people to conduct different workshops on storytelling, um, on, on, on anything like that. So uh, the $10,000 and, and also a go make a mention to the production of uh, these cookbooks that could then be um, shared among the community. So the, the $10,000 really allows us to enrich this program with all of these things beyond um, the it very important but just sort of minimal social gathering. And have, uh, sorry, a follow-up question. Have, have other um, uh, IRC groups in other places done this sort of thing? Yes, um, similar, they've, uh, at different IRCs throughout the country have administered different programs. Um, uh, and so one, one really cool example of that is there was a uh, similar program that was done in, um, I believe it was in our Phoenix uh, office where they um, basically made a quilt together um, through a grant and were able to make this quilt. Uh, that was a story quilt. And uh, the, uh, the women of that group did, uh, were able to gather for about, I think it was like 12 weeks or something and create uh, that story quilt with one another. That's the best example. So again, thank you so much, Matt and Sarah. And reminder, they will be available after. So our third final, so again, we talk about wanting to give our membership a diverse choice of, of the application. And um, I'm not going to go on that tangent until after the fact. So I would like to introduce Carol Roberts. I swear you emailed me, but I was like not sure if I had it right. So sorry, Mac, not chocolate. Uh, so we have Carol Roberts and Polly Small with the YWCA. Hi, I'm Carol Roberts. I'm the clinical manager at the YWCA. And Holly is with me. She's one of our amazing counseling interns, sexual assault advocates, group facilitators. What else do you want to say about yourself? <laughs> um, I'm, from, I'm from Montana. I'm in Northern Cheyenne. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm super, super lucky to have Holly on my team. Um, but I just want to like acknowledge something because listening to our other presenters thinking about all of the loss to abortion care, gender affirming care, thinking about the trauma of refugees. I'm just so grateful that we have opened our minds and hearts to that in the context of people who are stepping in and supporting. But I'm still feeling like, whew, and so I want to give you all a chance to like do this because we're about to talk about her. So, um, <laughs> just say it. And so I don't have uh, information about the whole of the YWCA, but everything we do is in the context of being part of an organization that runs our domestic violence shelter, our family housing program that's a collaboration with Family Promise, that is the Guts Empowerment Group for Youth, um, Play Kids, Supervised uh, Visitation Programs. Um, I don't know if we do a lot of things. Um, but what we what we focus on here is, is our um, sexual assault response program. Um, so this is a need that increases um, every year. I 
and we're part of our Pathways program um, that serves domestic violence survivors. Um, that includes our emergency shelter, 24-hour crisis hotline, walk-in counseling, advocacy support groups, counseling services, and then our team of advocates who are on call 24 hours a day um, to collaborate with our community partners when somebody shows up and has experienced a sexual assault. So whether they show up at an emergency room, at law enforcement, or at first step, um, where the forensic nurses uh, do better magic, um, the agreement in Missoula is to call an advocate. And so that's our 24-hour crisis line, and then they call Polly um, or any of 12 other people right now. And I can't tell you how much of an honor it is to work with those people, people who will get up at 2 a.m. and go, sure, I'm heading to the ER. I'll be there. Um, and so a lot of why we are here is because this, this is supported with money that we scratch and find all over the place um, because I do like to be able to offer a stipend to people that I'm asking to do that and uh, it pays for their gas and maybe they can get a sandwich if they didn't have time for lunch um, but otherwise they're doing it out of um, just you know being the person who will show up. Um, these are some of the lovely people do this job. A lot of what, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do out on the call, kind of the... Um, my, one of my first calls for shadowing with another person um, kind of turned out odd. Um, it, I was told it wasn't typical. <coughs> But it was an indigenous woman. Um, I'm sorry, it's like emotional. <laughs> um, her interaction with all of our systems in Missoula, all of our um, institutions, like law enforcement, the justice, um, healthcare, it created this concept for her that no one is no one is safe. And so that was like a really hard call for everyone, not just myself, but all the same nurses. Um, it was very, um, she was very aggressive. Um, and so it prevented us from doing our work, but um, it did start a conversation of how can we, what could we have done different? Um, as far as serving the indigenous community that have, I'm of color who see the system as like not a safe place. Um, that was my very first call. <laughs> it was like, whoa. Um, and then so I, I did go back again. Um, and so that the next call I went on was also not typical. <laughs> um, Guess what? There's no typical. Yeah, I, I slowly learned there is no typical. Um, but I showed up and they accepted it's an option if you want an advocate. Um, and we're just, we're there, we're ready. If they say no, it's okay when we go home, but most of the time they'll say yeah. And what we do is we go in and we sit with the victim, or the survivor, um, and we literally just rub their back if that's what is happening. We give them safety planning. We just come alongside them and sit with them in the most challenging experience of their life. Um, and we just, we go into the exam room alongside them. So we're, we continue the whole process throughout their time there. Um, and we just offer counseling, kind of crisis counseling. Um, one time I just sat outside in the, in the cold shivering um, while she smoked her cigarette and come back down so we could finish the, the whole exam. So, it's it's a lot of it's heavy, um, but it's very very needed. Yeah. So our our goal is to make sure that every survivor knows about the resources available, about what their options are. Oh, sorry. 
about what their options are, whether they want to report this to law enforcement or not, um, and what kind of care is available to them and support club we don't need to help them think through who you want to tell, how do you want to tell, how do you want to incorporate this into your story. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> the slides went faster than I wanted to. Um, and we mentioned that, that this need is increasing. Um, and I will talk about last weekend um, as an example of that. Um, fortunately, not every day is like this, but the Sunday before this last one, we started out with an advocate getting a call uh, from Ravalli County Police Department at 5 a.m. Uh, they had her number because she had supported someone the week prior who was now in need again. And she was refusing medical care, even though it was pretty urgent that she got medical care. Uh, and this, this survivor was saying, if you if you call my advocate, um, I'll go. Mm -hmm. And so they had her number. She was not the advocate on call. Um, her phone was ringing at 5 a.m. She, she met them at the ER. She called the advocate was a call and said, hey, can you join? So that advocate got up and joined, um, but then didn't get to leave after that call because another one came in. Um, she did get to go for a couple of hours and have lunch before the third call came in. And after 16 hours on her very first shift ever, uh, she went home. Um, and so I was really grateful to have some funds available that I could send her out to dinner with her partner and go, thank you for first day um, on the job because it was it was intense. It's not always that intense, but it can be. Um, that, can, that can be part of, of what it is. Um, so what we're going to do is, is then pivot because what we also offer um, are a lot of kind of uh, support programs for people who are trying to heal and recover whether from sexual assault or domestic violence. And as I'm sure you know, these overlap tremendously. Most people experiencing a sexual assault it is by someone they know um, and oftentimes by their intimate partner. And so we collaborate really closely with their shelter because sometimes we're bringing people in. Um, maybe they just need a little bit of time to figure out what they're going to do next. Maybe they need a lot of time. But once we've got people on site in our shelter, or we have people coming in from the community also looking for support. We have um, our support groups that happen every Tuesday night, and one of them is a talking circle that Polly has been facilitating for a little more than a year. So I'm going to let you talk a little bit about that and some of your dreams <laughs> for that talking circle, because that's a lot of why we're here. So when I came on to um, start talking circle, there wasn't really a structure in place. There was like, this is what people have done in the past. There's, you can really kind of tailor it to what you need. Um, I am not a ceremonial person, which is important to know for indigenous people. I am, I was raised with my traditional beliefs. Um, and so I was able to step into this role and pair it with my current graduate program as clinical mental health counseling. Um, and I look at it from more of a systems perspective of as indigenous women and just as women in general, we continue to not be oppressed by different institutions and even in our daily interaction. So how we are expected to present, um, how we are expected to portray our experiences and um, the talking circle gives us a space to kind of process those things that society says we should be talking about. Um, and it's a, it's like, it's an interesting role to be in because I go to, to the first step and respond to SA, um, as an SA advocate, and then I see them come through the system as a counselor and then as a talking circle facilitator and to see their journey um, is really special uh, and to see those moments in our groups where they feel empowered um, and experience relief that somebody is saying yeah your hardship it might not be your fault 
it might be our economy, it might be other historical expectations that aren't um, trauma-informed. So when, when we talk about systems, it gives them that relief of like, right, I can still succeed in life. Oh, some of my dreams. <laughs> some of my dreams for Talking Circle is to incorporate some indigenous games and um, approaches to and more of a therapeutic approach. So one of our more fun games that most tribes share because there's tribal specific things um, is called stick games, so also known as hand games. Um, and my, my approach is play the game in our group with processing how we develop and build trust again and how do we trust ourselves to be able to make those judgment calls of who's safe, um, what's right for me. And so it's kind of marrying the two things. So using this grant would allow me to make those purchases for materials um, that are not typically found in Walmart or Target. <laughs> as well as beginning activities that you want to do, the uh, activities that you want to do. There's many, there's a list. Yeah. <laughs> so our overall goals um, for kind of these two pieces that, that intertwine and weave together um, is to, to continue to be able to provide the crisis response services that we do um, to everyone who requests it. 24 hours a day, every day of the year, um, and to maintain uh, a, a really well-trained and well-prepared uh, group of advocates who are doing that. Um, like I said, we've got about 13 right now, um, and uh, that feels good. I don't, we don't have to ask too much of people, um, but they get to kind of get the involvement that they want. Um, and to continue working with other community partners, All Nations Health Center, to make sure that we're supporting our indigenous population as well as we can, um, because one of the um, heartbreaking statistics is that it, that population is over, is over represented um, in domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and, and otherwise also make ourselves just as trauma-informed as we can be um, so that we are building resilience and empowerment and for survivors that are working. So, I don't know if this time, no, whoops. doesn't really share Abby's story with you. I think that's on the little comments that we can't see, but, but what this story was, and this isn't really a picture of her, so we're not violating anyone's confidentiality here, but um, this was just a couple of months ago, um, uh, some, a survivor showed up at our Tuesday night open support group, um, just looking for somewhere to go where she could be with some other women, and she told her story. She. Um, had been out of state and been sexually assaulted and had um, not trauma-informed treatment by law enforcement in the state that she was in, was blamed for what had happened to her um, and faulted for um, some drugs that were in her system at the time. Uh, she made it back home to Missoula but was not okay. Um, she showed up in our group and we let her know about first step so she decided to go to first step and have a rape kit done and get some medical care for herself. And so our advocate joined at first step and supported her there. And um, in that process too, um, we realized she was eligible for our shelter. And so we brought her into shelter. Um, and through that process, she was able to start to work on what she needed to to get the child back who had been removed from her care. Um, start her own healing and reestablish herself in Missoula after some really traumatic experiences. And so she is an example of someone who utilized all the different pieces of what we do. Um, but um, I felt really good to be able to support all of the ways that she had. And so 
Yeah. 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 Um, any questions? Because I forgot a lot of things. <laughs> so thank you first. minutes for questions, but then remember, we have time to hang out. I'm just curious, I know the instance is important in zero enough, but do you have a sense of how many women um, would be participating, for example, in the talking circle, or how many women do you work with this year? Um, it depends on which aspect you mean. In the crisis response, where we go out, it's about 100 um, over the course of a year. Uh, people who come in for our counseling services, um, because everyone that we do crisis response with gets offered our free counseling. Um, not everyone, you know, takes us up on that. Um, but then some people um, access counseling because they came to support group or they're in our shelters. And so that um, is... I think the number of sessions we did last fiscal year was, I want to say, 300 and something, and I can't remember the number of, of people that that broke out to, but then the number of people who come to support group um, is another approximately 150 people in the year. And so, of course, these are not all necessarily unique individuals. Some of them are, are participating in, in multiple services. Yeah. Um, and also, it's kind of like a revolving door, to be honest. I, um, people can, are the women can come back to groups, so sometimes you get participants who have experienced SA and DV um, domestic violence years ago and just need that additional support, so it, they're, they are continuously coming back for support. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the most gratifying things is that the number of times that someone has come to support group and said, you know what, I was just having a bad day, and I knew this was going to be a really warm place to be with people who care. And that feels good. Thank you. So again, thank you to our three finalists. Uh, congratulations on getting your presentations done. But I also want to applaud and congratulate you on uh, all of the good work you're doing. And I know that it does. I just want to acknowledge what Carol said, that it's, these are some heavy topics. But I believe we're up for the challenge. Because I went to Missoula in 2000. And I have to tell you that I've experienced in Missoula, Montana, not that we're perfect, and we do lots of weird stuff, right? <laughs> but the one thing that I've seen in all the different little parts of the community that I've had the privilege of, of connecting to is that much like the giving circle, we give, we decide, no, I'm kidding. That was a bad joke. Uh, it's part of my charm, part of my challenge. Uh, but is, is that we come together in many different meaningful ways. And I know this is a hard choice, and I'm so grateful we're going to have time to absorb it, uh, because I can imagine, much like last year, and I'm guessing Terry is here. Where did, I saw her, but right in front of my face, that's why I'm going to see you. Our previous, oh, you're out of time, Carol and Paul. Uh, you know, our previous chair can tell you that each year, it's, it's, it's a challenge to make the choice. And so we want to keep coming together in this way that exposes us, lets us consider, lets us challenge everything we know about the truth to just be better versions of ourselves and to do more better together. And you do that. So I want to tell you about a little bit about the Giving Circle. I want to thank the steering committee for the marathon back to back. We had a very big steering committee meeting last night. Sorry, Mary. Um, and uh, and in, that, in that meeting, we got to talk about a lot of things. Um, you know, we're at a place, thanks to my predecessors, uh, I don't know why I thought you were over there, I was just looking at you, like Terry, and the women in 2018 who founded this Giving Circle, laid a great foundation, we continue to ground and grow together. Um, we get challenged by the question, how do we diversify, how do we grow, how are we doing, how does our membership feel? So I'm going to ask Jamie McConnell, 
who last night um, actually kind of something we've been talking about all year, and I think we've talked to some of you about it, um, agreed to chair a task force for us. So I just want to tell her, have her have a minute to tell you about it, and then we will wrap around, talk about membership for a hot second, I have some hot news for you, and uh, go from there, Jamie. talking about a lot over the past year is how we diversify the circle. Diversity is important, equity and inclusion are important values to the Women's Giving Circle. Um, and we want to see that reflected in our membership and in our steering committee. And so I'm going to be chairing an exploratory committee to figure out how do we do that. Um, and I welcome any of you who are interested to join me. And you can, I think we have a sign up sheet back there. Um, you can see Kathy and um, and see Kathy and sign up, and then I'll get in touch with you, and we'll figure this out together. So, yeah. Thanks. And if you can't tell, we're often figuring things out together. Sometimes in the moment we're doing that, right? And so I again just want to express my deep gratitude, and I get to announce. And I didn't ask again if there was an update, but the last live membership count of our giving circle is 93 women. And girls and non-binary individuals. I try my best to be politically correct and blow it all the time. So I am grateful for the gift of I keep the on compassion and compassion if we leave ourselves out. And I really want that's been my mantra lately. I've needed a lot of self-compassion. But I think it's so important that we continue to grow organically in the inclusive way, you know, honoring our values of community, equity, and inclusion. And so if you want to talk about our circle, I don't know if anyone here isn't a member, you're welcome to join us, but never an obligation, just an invitation. Because we give, decide, and benefit together in a way that increases our impact. And I think as we continue to do this and to grow, um, well, I can tell you my life's better because of all of you. So I thank you for that. Again, thank you to our finalists. Kathy's going to say something. <laughs> I just, thank you, um, Don. I just wanted to point out that we have QR codes on the table. If anybody is ready to vote now, I guess the vote is, is ready. And also, um, if you're like me, think about because the presentation is very amazing. But um, if you are not a member and would like to join, there's a different piece of paper, um, several different tables, and up here if you want to join immediately. And also there are stickers all around the flower decorations, and those are not just for decoration. You should take them and give them and put them on your water bottles and help <laughs> And I also have um, uh, brochures. I knew I was forgetting you, Kathy. Thank you. I, I'm so grateful for the way we have each other's back. Just make me feel useful, <laughs> No, you are useful. And, you know, if you want to thank someone for the fact that we have a lot of this stuff, again, I want to thank Ed Wilkes from the Missoula Community Foundation and, of course, Marcy and the Missoula Community Foundation. And uh, just so grateful to have a home. The other big announcement I debated, but I think I'm going to make it, and then I'll beg your forgiveness if I offend anyone. But uh, because we are 93 women, women and non-binary individuals strong, because we've done some work, we had a cha-ching committee, and I love that. That's the most fun name for budget task force I've ever heard. <laughs> because one of our goals is to become budget neutral for the community foundation, because it still costs them money to house us as a program. And, and that's a larger discussion. Jamie's going to lead next year with all of you, because we're close, man. We are so close. But because of that, in this fabulous cha -ching committee, next year we will be awarding $15,000. We will maintain at this time the $1,000 to each of the other two finalists, as in whatever. That'll, that'll happen in Jamie's committee. We'll talk more about that. And uh, Kathy gave us great starting places to have good discussion. And uh, again, the other thing that um, I'm just going to take a breath. 
Because these were presentations that I'm trying to like pretend that I'm a, a, a wonderful facilitator. <sighs> but um, I forgot. What did I forget? I mean, usually they all have my back. Kathy pipes up, someone pipes up. I think I forgot something. Oh, thank you. I knew if I was patient, I took enough grass, we get there. So I want to tell you, please look for our newsletter that will come out sometime mid-December where our winner gets announced. Also, our steering committee, we made a decision last night. We used to be a steering committee of 15, but in practical application, that wasn't what happened, so we changed to 13. But now, we've gone back, we have a steering committee of 9 to 15 members because we realize we need more flexibility in that because we had 13 members all year this year, and up until one of them moved, and that spot's still open, yeah. And uh, um, you knew that one's coming. And, but we have two other spots. So we have three spots available on our steering committee. That application was in the newsletter that uh, just went out. If you didn't get it, you will let me know, and I'm happy you can contact me at wgcchair at gmail.com. Or it's not hard to find a member from somewhere. And uh, if you're interested in joining the student committee, it's a powerful group. I, I am always awed at the great intelligence, the incredible compassion, uh, but also the wise, trust based philanthropy kind of values that keep showing themselves up at that table. So now I'm going to stop taking all your time because I know you all have more questions. So here are our finalists. Please mingle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.